thank you, thank you. First of all, can you all hear me okay? Sometimes I can shy out a little bit. No, I'm joking. I'm going to be very, very loud. So as Jasmine said, my name is Samuel Hickson, and I am the social worker and legal advocate here in the Patient and Family Services Division at Cleveland Clinic Lou Ruvo Center for Brain Health. One of my jobs here is to make sure that caregivers and patients alike not only understand the diseases that they are afflicted with, but also understand the options that are available to them, one in which being long-term care placement. Oftentimes, it is a topic that is very difficult, and as I tell my colleagues, it is a topic that people don't want to address unless they absolutely need it. The problem with addressing long-term care at that time is that it becomes too late. The moment you think you have to have the conversation is the moment that it is now too late, because the resources afforded to you for long-term care placement is slim to none, even more so how you cover the cost of long-term care placement is slim to none. As such, it creates such a daunting task for loved ones who are caring for individuals afflicted with neurodegenerative diseases, so much so that their loved ones die well before their patients do. And with that, I present to you Finding Home. In this seminar, we are going to talk about the varying different options related to long-term care placement, some of which you may know about, some of which you don't. Additionally, we're going to talk about the emotional component of placing a loved one in a nursing facility or any other type of long-term care facility, predominantly because people don't typically think about what it does to a caregiver when they have to consider placing their loved one in a facility. The guilt, the anguish, the back and forth questioning that you go through to determine, am I making the right decision? So who in this room is considering that option right now? Can you tell me what are your fears and worries about placing your loved one in a long-term care facility? We may not answer them right now at this moment, but we will address them later on in the presentation. Let's start with you in the back. Well, in my case, it's my spouse, and I think you've heard this many times. Um, we feel that no one is going to take care of your loved one the way that you do. Mm -hmm. So you feel that you have to take care of them the way you do. Good. Any other fears? Yes. Uh, it's my spouse, and then he's going to hate me. He's going to hate you. Okay. How about you? Anyone here? How can you pay for Okay. Anyone else? Yes. Yeah, mine kind of goes along with hers. I, I, I'm very apprehensive on the day that I take her, and then what's going to be happening after that. I want to go home. Where's Randy? Where's, you know, and, and just dealing with all of that. Right. The emotions sure. of placing, yeah, and absolutely. where are you, and how do you deal yeah. with that? These are fears and worries that are not uncommon. Every caregiver that approaches this topic all go through the same emotions. Even more so, there's back and forth questioning. Is it the right time or am I making the right choice? The problem with that question is 99% of the time caregivers settle on the wrong decision. Why? Because they don't place their loved one in a nursing facility, even though they know that they have to do so because of those very same fears. They're going to hate me. They're going to question where you are. But as you will discover going through this presentation, patients, despite their cognitive inabilities, have an incredible resilience about them. More often than not, it is the caregiver that is going through anguish while the patient doesn't really understand what's happening to them. So the question I pose to you is why is it that you are riddled with all of these emotions yet your loved one could care less? So when you're considering long-term care and answering that question, is it time, there are many different considerations that you have to take into account. Number one, are the care needs of your loved one being met? When you think about in your home, can you meet all of the biopsychosocial needs of your loved one? That means can you keep them safe? Can you keep them healthy? Meaning if you have to go to work and they have to stay at home and they forget to take their medication, are they healthy? Are they safe? Additionally, you have to think about the physical and mental health needs of my loved one. One of the many mistakes that caregivers make is the moment that physician renders a diagnosis, everything about that loved one becomes wrapped up in their home. They are removed from social interaction. They stop exercising. How many of you in this room have a loved one that 
had depression once they received a diagnosis. Did anyone experience depression or sadness or retreat into themselves? Again, is your loved one safe at home? How many of you have loved ones that fall? Despite no matter what you do, your loved one still falls. You've put up safety barriers in your home. You've redesigned your house so that there's universal living and yet your loved one still falls. Are they safe? And as the caregiver, what are your needs? For women, I find this happens a lot because you think that it is your responsibility, your duty as a wife, daughter, mother to care for your loved one beyond your capacity to do so. But you have to think, what are your needs? Are you going crazy? It's okay to say, yes, I am. Because naturally, we are not built to be caregivers. Humans are not built to be caregivers. If that were the case, people would not Oh. If that were the case, people would not be writing books on how to be parents. Just making sure that everything is okay at our remote site. They just shut Moving forward. We have a remote site that just came came in. I'm sorry. That's okay. Just dialed in because they had us at the wrong place. Oh, no worries. We're glad you're with us, Hawthorne. So moving forward. When you're considering what are the care needs of your loved one, you'll hear things that your physicians say, ADLs, or activities of daily living, IADLs, things of that nature. But basically, you're considering what is their quality of life? How can they care for themselves when you're looking at bathing, dressing, grooming, toileting? That seems to be the hardest one for people. You're very comfortable with wiping your child's behind, but when it comes to your spouse, it's a different ball game. You cannot seem to wipe their behind. And they can't do it. But we have this shame, both from the caregiver and from the patient, when it comes to that. Eating, walking, getting out of bed. Make no mistake, patients with neurodegenerative diseases oftentimes suffer from mental illnesses as well, predominantly being depression. They don't want to get out of bed. If they are at the earlier stages of the disease, it is because they recognize that something is wrong. And how would you feel if 70 years of your life was erased by something you didn't ask for? Consider their instrumental activities of daily living, like utilizing the phone or working a microwave. I can't tell you how many stories I hear where patients forget how to push the button on a microwave or the fact that they put something in the microwave that they shouldn't have put and it blew up, or they turned the oven on and walked away. You have to consider these. And when you consider these options, if your answer is no, again, I ask you, why are you riddled with guilt? When you cannot care for your loved one beyond your capacity. Keep in mind that 68% of all caregivers die before their loved one. 68% of all caregivers die before their loved one because they are trying to care for their loved one beyond their capacity. My division was built upon the back, literally, of a woman who tried to care for her husband beyond her capacity. Angie Ruvo, dedicated wife and mother, is now confined to either a wheelchair or a walking device because of the herniated disc she suffered. She now becomes a patient. Beyond that, we're looking at the physical health needs. Again, this is very important because we recognize certain symptoms that we brush off because people are getting old. I want you to understand that there's a difference between normal aging and abnormal aging. If your loved one falls because their legs get weak, that is not a normal aging process. Yes, we might lose some strength in our muscles, but not to the point that we topple over constantly while washing dishes. We recognize that our legs are weak, and what do we do? We sit down. Patients with neurodegenerative diseases don't recognize that their legs are weak, and if they do, they don't know how to control it before they fall. 
if you have frequent pain complaints, incontinence, difficulties with personal care, showering is a big issue, bathing is a big issue. Patients with Alzheimer's disease, for example, for some reason tend to have a problem with water. Or patients with Parkinson's who can't lift their leg above the tub, but you don't have the money to change your bathroom to be more universal. So you can't get a tub that opens and closes. They have to lift their leg. And what do you do when you are a five foot five woman and your husband weighs over 200 pounds and towers over you? Medication compliance. Who in here still works and cares for a loved one? How often do you leave for work and wonder, did they take their medication today? He goes to adult daycare on the work. Mm -hmm. He has to. So that you have adult daycare. But for others, they have to leave their loved one and wonder, did they take their medication today? Or you count the pills and realize that they didn't, despite the fact that they're staring in your face saying, yes, I took my medication today, I took my medication today, but they still have the same amount of pills in their box when you left. And lastly, sleep issues. We find this a lot. Caregivers who don't sleep oftentimes have mental health issues, behavioral disturbances. You become much more frustrated than you thought you would be because you don't sleep. And then you have to separate rooms. So your loved one sleeps in one room while you sleep in another room but then you worry constantly. Are they getting up wandering? Did they leave the house? Are they okay? For patients who have difficulties with swallowing, you wonder, did they asphyxiate? Do you have to turn them every few hours? Do they have accidents in the bed? All of these memories and emotions come up within you while you're trying to get a moniker of sleep. To go from eight hours to one. And if you're lucky, that's one. What are your mental health needs? As a therapist, mental health is my pride and joy because people seem to think that mental health is not a real disease. It's not a real sickness, but they hurt. They prevent you from living, both patient and caregiver alike. Are you witnessing personality changes in your loved one, in yourself? Take that into consideration. If you find yourself becoming much more aggravated, we have a problem. If you're irritated all the time, and it, no, it's not because your spouse is getting on your nerve. It is more likely that you have an inability to cope with being a caregiver. And I use that term loosely, because how you identify as a caregiver is up to you, not because a doctor told you that your loved one has a neurodegenerative disease. Are you insensitive to others? Is your loved one insensitive to others? I've had countless stories of loved ones who go to restaurants and decide to pull their pants down standing on a table. They don't care. They're having a field day. Are they disoriented all the time? Do you constantly have to redirect them every five minutes as to where the bathroom is or where their bedroom is? Did you now have to shift floors if you live in a two-story house because your loved one continuously falls down the stairs because they don't know to go left instead of right. Aggressive behaviors. Make no bones. Elderly people, yes, they may be elderly, but they hit very hard. They bite very hard. Repetitive behaviors or inabilities to communicate. For daughters, we are finding that this is incredibly painful when they cannot speak to their parent. For spouses, it is incredibly painful when you've spent 40 or 50 years married to someone constantly having conversations and yet they do not have the ability to communicate with you. You don't know what's wrong with them. They're in pain, they're in agony, they're sad, yet all you have to do is watch this happen. And they're socially withdrawn. People who used to be social butterflies, constantly entertaining, all they want to do now is shut themselves in a room because you can't be all things to your loved one. You cannot be their physician and their nurse and their caretaker and their best friend. It does not work. Okay. Is your loved one safe at home? Again, be mindful. It doesn't simply mean physical safety where they're falling down and you can actually see that. It's the things that you can't see. 
when you're sleeping, when you're at work, when you're trying to wash dishes or make sure that your HOA isn't finding you because your yard isn't up to code. These are things you have to consider because there are other things beyond physical manifestations that contribute to safety. Wandering being one of them. Does anyone in here have a loved one that still drives? Interesting story. One of my clients that I see, her husband has Alzheimer's disease but is still able to drive. Got into a car while she slept and ended up in Barstow, California. The only way they found her was because of a bracelet after he got into a car accident and wrapped his car around a tree. Wandering is a very big safety concern. And no matter how many times you try to update your house, they're not stupid. Much like a child, they will get what they want. So short of you putting a deadbolt lock that can only be opened by a key, your loved one may have problems with wandering. So this is you, in the flesh. You might be a Stepford wife or a Stepford daughter, but inside, this is you, and it's okay. Say that, it is okay not to be okay, because caregivers very seldom think about the things that they need or the things that they want. The moment that diagnosis is given, it's all about your patient. When did they take their medication? Yesterday. Do they have trouble bathing? Yes, they do. But does anybody say, how are you today? When you go into a doctor's office, how are you today, caregiver? And more to the point, when did I lose my name? My name is Samuel, not caregiver. How are you today? So if you feel like you don't look like this, there's a class that we can we want you to teach, just so that you know. So let me know. We can have you teach a class. But think about your needs. What are your mental health issues? Are you stressed out? Do you have other obligations besides being a caregiver? Your feelings of guilt. This is what I deal with day in and day out every day, Monday through Friday from 6.30 to 3.30 p.m. Every caregiver I know has guilt. Why? You didn't ask for this to happen to your loved one. You didn't ask for this to happen to you. You are doing the best you can do given your circumstance. If you have the ability to pay for adult daycare, wonderful. Some people don't have that. If you have the ability to even consider placing your loved one and know that you can afford it, why feel guilty? When did the world say you could not do what was in the best interest of your loved one, including putting them in a home. That wasn't in any of my training. You have to think about your ability to handle difficult behaviors. Contrary to what the world thinks, you do not have a Superman S on your chest. You cannot be all things to your loved one. Recognize that we are mortals, not gods. Additionally, your physical ability to care for your loved one. If your spouse is up here, but you're down here, and every time you have to go like this, we have a problem. You know you can't lift them. Are you suffering spinal subluxations because you constantly have to go like this? Do you develop arthritis or osteoarthritis earlier than you should because you constantly have your body in one position? But how often do you think about your physical limitations? Because it is your duty to care for your loved one. In your financial situation, which is why I'm assuming most of you are here today. Because if you're considering long-term placement, you want to know who's going to pay for it. So, planning ahead. Ideally, we would like to have these decisions made prior to us reaching this stage. Unfortunately, many of our loved ones didn't think about this in their youth because they didn't expect to be here this long. That is the reality. Our loved ones did not expect to live this long. You have to educate yourself. Yes, the law is not on your side. I'm sorry to tell you that and sorry to be blunt, but the law does not recognize the disease that you deal with. They think 
it is a natural progression of growing older. But they don't understand that dementia is not normal. They don't understand that Parkinson's or multiple sclerosis or Huntington's or MSA is not normal. Their goal is to make sure that their pockets stay big. So with 5.5 people, million people in America living with Alzheimer's disease, how do you think they would pay for this? The answer is they won't. So you have to plan ahead and consider the type of care that is best for your loved one. Nursing homes and assisted living are not the only long-term care that exists. Sometimes HIC homes and group homes fare better for your loved one than big institutions. So, important documents. If you have not already done so, make sure that you have the conversation with your loved ones about their wishes and desires. This will alleviate a lot of the guilt that many people seem to have. Contrary to what you think, your loved ones know. If they're at the earlier stages, have the conversation with them. If I'm not able to care for you, what do you want to happen? Do not remove them from the decision-making process because you think they're not able to handle it cognitively. Make sure that your powers of attorneys are in place. Let me preface this by saying power of attorneys do not really hold legal ground. Why? because the law already defaults to the next in command. So if you are a spouse, the law will already default to you because you are married to this person. If they become incapacitated, you're next in line anyway. The power of attorney only tells the hospitals or any other institution that my husband or wife said, I want this person to be my power of attorney. But if they don't already if there's no opposition to that, the law would do it anyway. So they don't be, they're not recognized by many institutions. I always encourage conversations about guardianship. People seem to think that guardianship is the worst thing on the planet because legally it strips the rights from your loved one. But that is up to you to decide. You have to have conversations with your loved one. The rights mean nothing. It's how you involve that person. Now, are there some really bad guardians? Absolutely. And we would hope that it does not come down to that. But let me tell you, if you wait for your loved one to progress, the law will not be your friend. And you have the likelihood of having some stranger be a guardian to your loved one. So have that conversation with them. So there are differing types of care. One, informal, family, friends church members that you know that are willing to step up and help you to provide you with that respite care. There are in-home care, so actual organizations that are designed with trained professionals to come into the home and care for your loved one, visiting angels, comfort keepers, organizations like that. There's home health care. Let me preface by saying that home health care has to be ordered by a physician because that means that there is a medical necessity for which most Medicaid and Medicare will pay for that. It is typically a short-term care, about six months, whether it's physical therapy, occupational therapy, or a nurse to come into the home. Then there's adult daycare centers. This is more social action in nature, and that your loved one goes and is amongst people such as themselves. <clears throat> a lot of times we hear that loved ones don't want to do this. They're afraid, they're oppositional when they get there. So slow integration into this process is very important. Drop them off a couple hours, pick them up, increase. Drop them off for a day, pick them up, okay? The slower you integrate them, the more successes you tend to have versus just dropping them in there. Why? Because their brain is slower to respond to external surroundings, so everything is danger to them everything much like a child stranger danger that's what you're going through with your loved one if for some reason your loved one progresses and you are considering long-term placement meaning you need to take them out of your home there are differing options you have assisted living facilities that <clears throat> most of the time will have memory care there are not that many in las vegas but they do exist there are group homes which are smaller in nature, so I always get the question, what's the difference between an assisted living and a group home? Assisted living are typically larger, 
In nature, they have about 100, 150 beds, typically. Group homes do not. They have at most about 10 beds. Um, depending on the group home, they can range from five to 10, but they're not very large. The same is with HIC home, which stands for individual housing for individual care, excuse me. And those are smaller than group <coughs> homes. They function as the same type of structure, but they have about two to three beds, sometimes four, if they're willing to accommodate that, but they're not as big as group homes and they're certainly not as big as assisted living. The benefit to those is number one, you get more of a one-on-one -on -one interaction with your loved one. Additionally, they're typically more affordable. They don't cost as much because the level of care is not really needed um, in terms of your loved one and how much that person has to spend with them. Additionally, the person who owns the HIC home normally knows what you're going through because they've been there. So the HIC homes that exist in Las Vegas, most of them are here because their person who owns them has had an experience with Alzheimer's disease typically, so they know the gambit of the disease. Then you have hospice care. For some reason, there is a very large misconception about what hospice care is supposed to do for you. Um, number one, understand that to be admitted into hospice care, two things have to happen. One, you typically have to be within six months of your demise. So two physicians have to say that this person is within six months, or it has to be declared that your loved one is not going to get any better. So there are people who ask me, well, the hospice care wants to discharge my mom and my dad or my loved one because they say that they're not getting better. Correct. If during evaluation, which is typically about 60 to 90 days, the person has to be reevaluated. If they do not show any progression, the hospice institution does have the ability to discharge your loved one. Okay? In which case, you really need to look into other options. So we talked a little bit about respite care, which is basically giving you a break so you don't rip your hair out and have bald spots in your head, you know, because no matter what, Rogaine doesn't always work. So you wanna make sure you're not ripping out hair where it doesn't need to be ripped out. There are in-home care options, again, comfort keepers, visiting angels, so on and so forth, adult daycare, and short-term facility stays, which people never really think about. Um, the question, where do I put my loved one when I wanna go on vacation? That's where, short-term facility stays. There are very few of them here, but they do exist, and it's to provide you an opportunity to house your loved one in a facility while you do what you need to do if it's going on vacation, so on and so <coughs> forth. Payment for care and long-term care. The question, how do I pay for it? The answer, out of your own pocket because long-term care is considered custodial care. There's really no medical necessity in the eyes of the law. We do not expect the government to pay for your loved one to survive beyond their expiration date, as the law puts it. So it will come out of your pocket. And typically, you're looking at roughly about $20,000 a month. Roughly. And that's on the cheaper end. Say that again. You're looking for long-term care, it's typically about $20,000 a month, depending on the institution that you've put them in. We've heard less, 5,000, 6,000, 7,000. Um, those are for places that are not Las Ventanas. So if you know Las Ventanas, you understand what their system is like. They are very, very expensive. For them, it's roughly South of 20, it's about 15 per month, but even still, who has that in their bank account? And you're expected to come up with 5,000, let's say, on the lower end. When you're looking at group homes or HIC homes, they're a few thousand dollars, not as much as assisted living facilities and certainly not as much as skilled nursing homes, but they're still a few thousand dollars per month. If you are a veteran, I get this question a lot about veterans' benefits. In order to qualify for aid and accessibility, you have to have been a veteran of the Korean War or the Vietnam War. Those are the only two that they will accept at this time. That does provide a substantial financial benefit, but you have to prove that. They were a veteran from Vietnam or Korea, and they have to have been in active duty. So if they were in reserves, it does not count. But if they were active, it will count. I advise you to do this about six to seven months 
before you actually place because that's how long it will take the administration to get everything sorted out. Um, the other option that you have, if you don't already have it, is long-term care insurance, but you do have to have this prior to your loved one being ill. Um, it will not work if your loved one is already ill, but you do have to have this, or life insurance with a long-term care rider. Um, that will also help to cover the cost of some of the long-term care as well. There might be some type of out-of-pocket expense, but it certainly won't be in the thousands of dollars. Now, I oftentimes get questions about how do I evaluate which is safe for my loved one because obviously you can't be there all the time to see what really goes on. Any institution that is established to care for vulnerable populations for which the elderly is one has to be evaluated and inspected by the state and federal government if they are Medicaid eligible facilities. Um, in which case those are public documents and the link is listed. I think you all have a copy of my presentation. The link is actually listed in there for you to review. And what it will do is it will provide a grade of the institution, A through F, much like health services does to restaurants. And then it will list deficiencies if there are any in what was done to correct it. Now the inspectors are very fickle. I've heard of facilities getting Fs just because a light was broken. So they are very fickle, um, but I certainly encourage you to look at that website because it provides you with access to see what your eyes don't see when you visit. There's a question? How often are those reviews done? Typically every year, um, typically, because any institution that receives federal funding, which most of them do, have to be reevaluated every year for fiscal purposes. Is it done by appointment or do they just show up? They just show up, they pop up. Um, the inspectors caught on very quickly that when you were to give an appointment to the institutions, they would try their best to make sure that everything was up to code. So they started doing random inspections. They show up unannounced, much like social workers do when we have cases, we show up unannounced to get the accurate picture. All of the inspectors are not social workers. They are actually people who have been highly trained to inspect. So most of them are healthcare workers um, or people who have public health degrees most of the time. No, because every state has different requirements. Um, every state, because they receive Medicaid and Medicare, the eligibility requirements are different depending on the state and therefore the rules that are produced are different. Every state has a Health and Human Services division in which that link will be provided under that division. It might be named a little bit differently, but it will have every state has a Health and Human Services division. So again, how do you find quality care? Those are those links that I just mentioned on how to review the reports. They are very standard. They were written for the general public. It's not to confuse you with mumbo jumbo science. It's to make sure that your loved one is cared for and well cared for. Every client that I see, we review this link together. We go through the reports together. It will also help you find a facility within your location. We're finding this very helpful for people who live in Param or Elko or places of that nature where they really don't have much of things. Um, but this website will help you find what's in your geographic location. So it is very helpful, um, again, because we also process the emotions. Um, once you click, you start getting flooded with emotions um, because now it becomes real. So we wanna make sure that we're monitoring that as well. Um, the transition of your loved one, it's more transition for you because you have those questions, are they going to hate you? Are they going to not remember your name? We've had clients that tell us they have to prove that they're married every time they go visit their loved one. The question that I am going to pose is, is their quality of life better in this institution? That is what it boils down to. At the end of the day, caregivers all go through a grieving process much sooner than the ordinary person because you have to say goodbye to the person that your loved one was and say hello to the person that they are today. For most people, they cannot get over that. The person that you see before you may not be your loved one anymore. You still have love for them, of course. You can't erase 50, 60 years of memory. 40 even. 
but that is not the person that you knew. And even if we did find a cure, they will not be the same. So the transition is more for you. Do they become disoriented? Absolutely. If you take someone with a cognitive impairment and put them in a new location, they're going to get disoriented. Are they going to hate you? Probably. But then five minutes later, when you walk through the door, they're going to smile at you. Every caregiver we have goes through this process for those that considered long-term care placement. And every one of them has been happier for it. I have yet met one to say they regret the decision that they made. They regret not doing it sooner. Yes? In your first statement up there, you've got, you know, try to provide as much information as is appropriate mm -hmm. for the one you're taking care mm -hmm. of. I ain't saying anything right. to her at this point because mm -hmm. I know that will just confuse mm -hmm. her even though it's a few weeks down the road before right. she goes in. So mm -hmm. you can't use logic, so right. what are you suggesting there? So we really don't. Um, the hard part for people who are more advanced, which is when we mostly consider long-term care placement, is you really just have to drag and drop. Drag and drop, because no matter what you say to them, they're going to forget it. If they're more advanced, if they have other diseases like multiple sclerosis or Parkinson's, they may understand what's going on, so your transition is easier. But trying to pull them into your reality will create headache for you, because they don't understand why you're doing this. They will never understand why you're doing this. It's much like taking a child to pre-K. They kick and scream and want their parent, but what does pre-K tell you to do? Leave. Leave. Because sooner or later, they will calm down, and that's what has to happen. The problem with people who are caring for individuals with neurodegenerative diseases is that they don't understand the progression. Much like a child, if you're a parent, this will make sense. When you have a newborn, they can't communicate, they can't tell you what they want. You learn from the cries that they have, the behaviors that they do, up until the age of 18 when you get them out, hopefully. With neurodegenerative disease, you're going in reverse, right? The only difference is when they're leaving the house, it's because they're passing on. They cannot communicate. So much like you did with your child, you use the exact same processes with your loved one. Okay, so drag and drop. It's going to hurt you more than it will hurt them. Believe me when I say. Because in five minutes, they're going to forget what you did and probably find a boyfriend or a girlfriend in there or someone that is very close to them. <laughs> Every person we have says that their loved one found a special friend while they were in there. So it will hurt you more than it will hurt them. Okay? and make sure that their needs are being met. We oftentimes have caregivers that go every single day to visit their loved one. What I do with my clients is I typically tend to weigh, weigh them down. So if they're going every day, we then go to three times per week, two times per week, then one time per week. Um, the reason for that is because ultimately you have to be able to move on with your life once your loved one passes away. It is inevitable. So we have to be able to get you to move on. And what happens is because we don't deal with the grieving process while the loved one is still here, the caregivers fall into deep depressions because they don't know how to move on. They've cared for their loved one for 10, 15, 20 years. It's all they've ever known for 10, 15, 20 years. They don't know what to do. It's much like a college student. When we graduate, we expect to wake up and go to class the day after graduation. But that's not our life anymore. So by weaning yourself down, you metaphorically start saying goodbye to your loved one so that when that day comes, it is easier for you to process. Is it 100% easy? No. But it will be easier. Yes? Sam, there's some cases where I found that um, sometimes if the family is, comes too often, mm -hmm. Um, the staff doesn't get a chance to really, the, 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 your loved one doesn't get a chance to really get to know the staff no. and the staff vice versa. Correct. And, and like you said earlier, no one is going to care for your loved one like you do. And so you'll be constantly, you know, criticizing, you know, maybe yes. not right to their face, but it's mm -hmm. always going to be an issue. Yes. And, uh, sometimes and when I was working in memory care, I told some family members because they were so um, 
they, they were so obsessed about seeing their loved ones that stay away for a few days. Let your loved one get used to it because every time it's so hard mm -hmm. on the caregiver. Yes. And then it's also hard on your loved one because mm -hmm. they'll they'll keep reminding you that you right. did this to me. And so right. there's, right. I, I think it's sort of an individual. Yes. You find it very individual case. Right. right? Which You're brings me to my next point is that every decision that you make is your decision. Your case is not the same as any other case that I have. I say if you've met one person with Alzheimer's disease or dementia, then you've met one person because the resources available to you are not the same as someone else. Your experience is not going to be the same as yours, as yours, as yours. What will be the same is that it's always a difficult decision to decide to place your loved one in a home, which is why I've titled this presentation Finding Home. Because the moment they leave your house, they now have a new home. And for most of you, you've already been dealing with this. When they say, I want to go home, I want to go home, I want to go home, but they're standing in your living room. Because to them, home is 50 years ago. So no matter where you put them, they're never going to be home. Where we turn this around is the home that provides them the best care for them. Always remember, you are doing the best you can given what you know and the resources you have. We are not experts. We will never be experts. Otherwise, book writers wouldn't be rich because they feel like they know a lot more for you. So with that, there are a number of different resources that you can utilize. They are listed in your PowerPoint presentation, so I won't go through all of them. Um, always know that we here at Cleveland Clinic, Lou Rubo Center for Brain Health, are always available to you to answer questions. I may not get around to it within 10 minutes, but you'll certainly get an answer from me that day um, because every question is important. I never assume that I have the right answer all the time. I hear your story and I make sure that if I don't know the answer, I get it for you. And if I do know the answer, I provide it to you in a way that you understand. Um, but I'm a very touchy-feely person, so I want to make sure that your emotions are in check, okay? So if you call me, be prepared for me to ask you, how are you doing today? Because I really care a lot about how you're doing. Your loved one has a number of doctors who are working on them, but my job is to look after you. So with that, I would like to thank you and open the floor to questions, but we will start with our remote site since we've got a couple of questions here in the room first. So let's start with the remote sites. Any questions in Elko, Hawthorne, Param, remote sites? Okay. It was a little tough for people, so some people left, um, which I understand. It's a very tough topic, but it's important that we have the conversation now before it becomes too late. So I understand we have a question here. I see your phone number, you have an email address? I do. Uh, I'm not sure if it's on there, but it's Hyksos, H as in Henry, I, C as in cat, K, S as in Sam, O, S as in Sam, at CCF as in Frank, dot, or, yes, ORG, thank you, I forgot for a moment. <laughs> Yes, um, and I normally respond faster to email than I do phone call. You'll typically get a response from me within 30 minutes or so. Other questions? Yeah, yes. Um, just on long-term care, uh -huh. how many of your patients come in that have that insurance? Zero. I figured. Mm -hmm. Their caregivers are starting to get the insurance, but none of my patients or my clients have it. Um, some of my clients are well endowed, so they don't really need the insurance. Um, their loved ones are now getting it because we've talked about it, and since they know what this is like, um, we want to make sure it doesn't happen to them, so they now have it, but the, most of my patients, they don't have it. Um, some have veterans coverage, but beyond that, none of them. Yeah, I was just uh, wanting to know because I know they offer it uh, as a federal employee to federal employees yes. and we have it there. And I always encourage you to keep in mind that you need to check with your health 
depart your health benefits department or your human resources. Um, the reason for that is because most, unlike federal employees, which it typically goes beyond their employment there, most institutions will offer this benefit. The problem is that it is while you're employed there. Once you leave, it no longer happens. It's not like a 401k, but for federal employees, we typically have. Um, you mm -hmm. retire with it, I mean, you're working there, you leave right. with it, and they still pay. Yeah. Right, so right. I was just wondering. Mm -hmm. okay. No, none of my patients have it. I only have about 10 that are veterans that were lucky to get it, and they're now in the veterans group home. Um, but most of my patients don't have it. Well, again, as I mentioned, they didn't expect to live this long, so they didn't think that they needed it. We have a long term health care insurance, uh -huh. Is it, and he also was a vet during the Korean War. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to have benefits from the VA and the long term care? Yes. It is. So typically what happens is in order for any federal entity, VA, Medicaid, Medicare, to enact its benefits to you, you have to exhaust your assets, typically. Um, now, there is a difference for spouses because there is spousal impoverishment that protects the spouse from becoming impoverished because of the care that they have to provide to their loved one. But yes, it is possible for you to have both. The difference is that the VA will want you to exhaust your long-term care before they will enact their benefit for you. Um, most of their funding goes to people who really don't have any long-term care insurance and need that benefit, um, but you can have both. And I do have clients that have both. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, you had mentioned that it was a different type of the VA benefit for Vietnam or Korea, but mm -hmm. there's the, also the aid and attendance so, for any war at aid, active duty, right? Aid and attendance is the benefit, but in order for you to qualify for the long-term care part of it, you have to have been in Korea or Vietnam. And we fought them a lot on that, mm -hmm. and they will only take Vietnam or Korea. Not, even, you, not even World War II? No. Mm -hmm. you, and you have to have been active. We're trying to change that, and they've assured us that they're working on it. Uh, we posed an argument to them that a lot of the people who are in wars after that are now starting to develop the diseases. And if your job is to protect veterans, then it has to be beyond those two wars. Um, because the diseases, we now understand, are not solely targeting people in their 60s. And their rationale for that was, we think that these two wars Today, the people would be at the age in which Alzheimer's strikes. But we brought up to them that you can have early onset Alzheimer's, which strikes earlier than 60. Um, and again, if your job is to protect veterans, then we need you to protect veterans. So they've assured us that they're looking into it. Again, they don't understand enough about the disease to change their policy. And it has to go through a lot of different legal channels. Um, but we're working on it. Right now, the criterion is that they have to have been in Korea or Vietnam as active duty, not reserve. And there are different types of veteran benefits, too. Correct. There's a benefit that they can get home care. Correct. Um, the problem is that it required documentation. And for many of my clients that I see that were veterans, their documentation was lost. So what happens is they now have to go back to Washington to verify that this is and was an active service member and is now a veteran, and they are applying for this. So because the paperwork was lost, especially if the person moved states, they have to go through Washington, which is why it takes us six to seven months to get the benefits. Mm -hmm. But there is differing types, yes. Other questions? Well, if there are no other questions, thank you so much for being here today.